wieczór Państwu. Witamy na wszystkich na panelu pod tytułem Nowa Odpowiedź UE. Panel entitled EU New Response to War Refugees. We have Natalia Melnik, the Executive Director. Cieszę się. That we have Janina Ochojska, Euro MP, humanitarian activist, the founder of the Polska Akcja Humanitarna. Good evening, good evening. And I believe we do not have Gerard Knaus with us online yet. No, not really. All right. So we'll stay in the group of three. Ladies, on the official EU website devoted to refugees, in the very beginning we get a message. The EU and its member states intensify their efforts to work out an effective humanitarian and safe European migration policy, which translates into we have no effective, safe and humanitarian European migration policy. The question is, whether the situation we have now, that is, the war in Ukraine, does create new reality in the topic. On the 4th of March uh, this year, several days after the war started, the EU started, introduced a temporary protection system to relieve national protection systems and give the refugees the uh, rights that cover access to the labor market, education for children, health care. Natalia, first to you. How the EU citizens see the reaction of European states in accepting Ukrainians fleeing their country? I will start with a disclaimer first. Um, I don't have a first-hand experience of um, being a refugee, so because I'm still based in Ukraine. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the experiences that my friends and friends of friends have gone through, um, but also my perception of what's going on. And the main one would be that it was probably one of the biggest uh, shocks uh, to us as Ukrainians, the way that Poland um, handled the situation. Obviously, a pleasant shock, a positive one, um, because, you know, we've, we've had our historic issues, Ukraine and Poland, uh, but um, the response to um, millions of people crossing the border uh, was overwhelmingly positive. And it's it's very much appreciated because um, um, you know Ukrainians had a plan A, right? Because we knew that there was a military buildup at the border, and we knew that there was a possibility that that would happen. That's why a lot of Ukrainians had uh, panic bags packed, um, probably all the way back even in October. So October, November, they had the bags packed, and they kept complaining that because it's taking so long for Russia to attack, they kept eating snacks packed in those bags so that they would have to restock all the time. But then when it happened and the way it happened, uh, plan A was to go to Western Ukraine because it was supposed to be the safe area, right? And then February 24th, Western Ukraine was bombed as well. So um, to um, a huge um, shock of a lot of people, and that's why we, would, we saw waves of Ukrainians headed to Western Ukraine and then crossing the Polish border. And then Western Ukrainians themselves uh, panicked and crossed the Western border. So um, Poland basically opened the border completely, right? So you didn't need to have any kind of documentation to leave the country, even if you were leaving with kids. And we know that according to the data, 93% of Ukrainian refugees are women, and um, a lot of them are with children. That was one of the main motivations to leave the country. And we do have the, um, the numbers that say that 5 million Ukrainian refugees have already returned to Ukraine, um, but most of the, those are without children. 
Um, so for many Ukrainians, um, a chance to be safe in Europe um, is very much appreciated because their children can go to school. Like you said, we, we have this chance um, to get some kind of normalcy for, uh, for these children and an opportunity to work. Because the interesting situation with Ukrainian refugees is not only is the majority women, um, but um, the majority of them age-wise are between 30 and 49 years old. So they are relatively young. And uh, um, more than 80% of those people have either completed higher education or um, interrupted higher education. So these are highly skilled people who want to work. And uh, um, the latest data I saw said that um, 30, 100,000 Ukrainian refugees are employed in Poland right now. Um, and that Poland was expecting to have over 300,000 Ukrainian children enrolled. Um, in schools, but um, surprisingly, the number was a lot lower than that. It's 185,000. Um, but uh, it's explained by the fact that a lot of Ukrainian children do online schooling uh, because of the fact that uh, these refugees are planning to go back. Um, one of the surveys that I saw um, said that 91% of these refugees um, want to go back home, but they do not necessarily know when they will be able to do so. So it's not necessarily the immediate future. So we do have this um, quite unique situation, I would say. And, uh, um, but definitely the EU countries response and Poland leading the way was overwhelmingly positive, which we will never forget, I can tell you that much. Thank you very much indeed. We have Gerald Knaus with us, the president and founder European Stability Initiative, the author of the book entitled What Borders Do We Need? Now the question to Janina Ochojska. Is there any possibility that the legal solutions, but also the social capital that we generated in Poland and other EU member states after the 24th of January can be used, directly translated into migrants from other regions of the world, mainly Northern Africa and Middle East. Alas, I wouldn't be so optimistic here because, of course, the Polish border Uh, along Ukraine was really open. Ukrainians were allowed to freely cross it. But please remember the cases of people who were staying in Ukraine but were not Ukrainian nationals. They were students or en route. And those people couldn't cross the border so easily. That is one thing. Then, exactly at the very same time, a bit to the north on the Belarusian border, people were pushed to forests, swamps, uh, wired, barbed wires. There were children, pregnant women, migrants, mainly from Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, Iraq. And there was no such an opening of the border as in the case of the Polish-Ukrainian border. Well, these were decisions made by our authorities. However, until today, these matters have not been regulated and I keep wondering how far the success of Polish society in being open to Ukrainian refugees could be translated into the will to understand and accept refugees who come from all the countries, from countries with, at war. 
and here I can see no consent from the state. This government is absolutely against accepting uh, refugees of different skin color, different religion, and generally this government grasped the power by using strong rhetorics against migration threat, presenting it in an in a crazy manner by building fears that they only are coming here to rape our women and cut off their breasts. Just the level of this information shows what kind of people can build such policies. I wouldn't like to mention the infamous conference by Mr. Kaminsky but further on, I need to mention that the economic crisis we are facing today makes Poles be afraid of how they are going to cope. And in, on social media, and not only, you will find words saying that the Ukrainians are taking away from us. They will take everything. It's going to be cold winter. How are we going to manage? I am convinced that if we f adhere to the law, because published problems come from failure to observe the law, we use illegal practices against migrants. Every person has the right to apply for international protection, and the state may reject the application, but it all should be by the book. Then, even the opposition today, because the election campaign has started, the opposition is not building a positive policy around migrants, and we need migrants. So they are not building this positive policy because they are afraid that speaking good about migrants will make their bars drop. I'm not truly really convinced. I believe that building the positive vision that we need migrants and they need us. If all goes by the law, there will be no problem. Poles accepted about 3.5 million Ukrainians. Majority of uh, a majority of them who stayed here are living in uh, houses rented by from Poles or are hosted by Poles, and uh, we didn't get any poorer, nothing wrong is happening. This experience only shows that we are capable and we have place in Poland for as many as 5 million refugees, migrants, and certainly we could use those people. And briefly addressing uh, uh, my four speaker's words, you sort of confirmed again that people who flee, especially at the initial moments of war, are the people who have certain resources and people well educated who know how to cope in life. So the first wave is usually the most valuable because they are people who can work, who can provide different types of jobs, and uh, lack of knowledge is not an obstacle here. Thank you. Gerard, over to you. Is, the, is it possible to have one coherent migration policy throughout the entire European Union, or 
or, or, or this policy should be within the uh, uh, member states' uh, uh, decision. Hello. Uh, I hope my question is good enough. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. I hope it works. I'm in Western. I'm in Western France at the moment, so I apologize uh, that I'm not with you. Let me talk about uh, two issues to answer your question. Uh, the first one is: What is Europe's common policy today at the borders when it comes to irregular migration? And the reality is, sadly, that Europe's common policy today at the borders is pushbacks. What we've seen in the last um, uh, two years is the normalization of pushbacks. We've seen it on the, uh, in the Mediterranean, and we have seen it um, on the border in the east. Viktor Orban introduced pushbacks in the law in 2016. The European Court of Justice condemned his asylum law, saying that pushbacks, automatic pushbacks to Serbia were illegal. And Hungary has refused to implement the judgment by the highest court in the EU. Since the last two years, nothing has happened. We have also seen last year Poland, Lithuania and Latvia pass laws that allow the pushback of people into Belarus, including children. These laws have not been challenged. We have also seen by the European Commission. We have also seen the constant practice of pushbacks at the Croatian Bosnian border and at the border of Greece with Turkey. Last year, 2021, the Greek Minister of Migration said that 30,000 people were rescued by Greek boats in the Aegean, but less than 5,000 people were officially arriving on the islands, according to the Minister of Migration. The missing 25,000 who were rescued by the Greek uh, Coast Guard or who were found but who never arrived on the islands, were pushed back. So if you ask me today, what is Europe's policy at its external borders? The sad reality is it is a policy not based on law, but on pushbacks. And it has been leading to very low numbers of arrivals in the last two years, for example, from Turkey to Greece. How we get out of this situation is a really important issue that my colleagues and myself work on, because the key, of course, is to convince governments and majorities in the societies. And you know how hard this is in Poland. Well, it's no different in Croatia, in Hungary, in Greece, um, or elsewhere. But let me also say something on the Ukrainians. Here, the European Union has a common policy, which is different. The major reason it is different is because Ukrainians, when the war erupted, could travel visa-free to the European Union. This made all the difference. I remember with my colleagues pushing for visa liberalization for 10 years for Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine. And when Ukrainians got it in 2017, of course, nobody knew how important it would be in the context of this war. When Ukrainians started crossing the border in uh, incredible numbers in the first few weeks of the war, nobody in Europe was so cruel to suggest to introduce a visa requirement. No government. So then it was clear that Europe had no control. However many Ukrainians wanted to come would come. And it was clear that no asylum system in Europe could cope with so many applications. So the decision that was then made, which was the right one, was also without an alternative. 
that all of the European Union agreed that Ukrainians could go to any country and stay without an asylum application under temporary protection. Now, what has been the result of this? The number of Ukrainians who have applied for temporary protection in the European Union at the moment is around 4 million. The distribution has been by laissez-faire. Ukrainians can go wherever they want to go. The result is, however, that today the distribution is incredibly unequal. We have, if we look at the temporary protection applications, uh, a very high number of applications, and that means the mo it's the big, best indicator how many people there are in the Baltic states, in Bulgaria, in Slovakia, and especially in Poland, and most of all in the Czech Republic. The Czech Republic has seen 430,000 applications for temporary protections from Ukrainians. That is an incredibly high number. Now, by comparison, Germany until now has about 1 million Ukrainians that have registered. Um, the state of Baden-Württemberg, which has the same population as the Czech Republic, has taken in 130,000 Ukrainians, which is a record number of refugees for Germany, the highest number ever. But it's a third the number that are in the Czech Republic, just to show you how much uh, the Czech Republic are doing. And yet, if you compare the state of Baden-Württemberg, which has 11 million people and 130,000 Ukrainians registered for temporary protection, with France, you see that all of France has less Ukrainians than Baden-Württemberg. And France, Spain and Italy together have less Ukrainians than the Czech Republic. Now, you could say that's fine. It's working. The trouble is what will happen this winter if the strategy, the cynical strategy of trying to create more refugees through terror that is being announced by the Russian government and by President Putin, by destroying infrastructure, uh, heating, electricity, bombing cities, very consciously trying to create reasons for people to flee again. What if people have to flee Ukraine during this winter? Where would they go? And so I think what we need to discuss today in Europe, in the European Union, is how countries could cope and provide humane conditions if this winter another two to three million Ukrainian, mainly women and children, who have been here before and who returned to Ukraine in the last few months, as has been pointed out, have to come because they will not be safe uh, to live in Ukraine today. Now, let's all hope it will not happen. Ukrainians want to go home, it has been said. Many of them did go home. They would like to stay in Ukraine. But let's also make sure that if people come, Europeans are able to provide them with, with humane conditions. And that requires planning now, because in Germany or in the Czech Republic, if another 2 million will come now, there would be likely 10 cities like we've seen during the refugee crisis six years ago. But if we manage to mobilize reception, capacity, families in Spain, in Italy, in France and in other countries, it should be possible to host even another 2 to 3 million Ukrainians without any serious difficulty. So this is the kind of debate we need in Europe today. And it means that the laissez-faire approach we've had in the last eight months might not be enough for this winter. Natalia, can you imagine the situation as follows? European Union makes Ukrainian refugees not to be able to choose the country they want to flee to and they impose administrative decisions saying this family should settle down in Spain, the other in Germany, another in Poland. Because as a matter of fact, what Gerard said, 
boils down to this kind of administrative mechanism that we tried to implement in the European Union once. I'll give you the floor back, uh, but this mechanism was not accepted here. Well, you know, um, when Ukraine, the first wave of Ukrainians that fled, um, I don't think that they had a chance to really choose right where they're going. So obviously to most of them, Poland was first destination. And when they got a bit of time, they started researching um, whether they should stay or whether they should move on. Um, and it really boiled down, um, well, partly to what countries offer as uh, um, you know, financial assistance, um, because we do see differences from countries to countries. And another thing is um, basically local regulation. Um, my, one of my colleagues uh, is in Germany right now as a refugee. My other colleague is in France. And uh, France is a nightmare, right? So no, no uh, Ukrainian who has done research will choose to go to France as a refugee because it takes months to be able to rent a place. So it just makes no sense, right? So um, the ease of living, of existing, uh, you know, if you don't want to be in a shelter or you, you want to build a life for yourself, even if it's temporary and your kids, uh, it does really matter which country in the European Union it is. I do not think many Ukrainians will be against going to Spain, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Uh, but once again, it really depends what conditions they will be faced with. Um, but what we need to understand is, in Ukraine right now, there are about 8 million internally displaced people. So they already had to leave their homes, right? If the situation becomes um, extreme, and you know, with a nuclear threat and everything, um, it's not difficult to imagine that the situation will indeed get worse. And a couple of days ago, we, we saw the biggest missile attack on Ukraine so far. Um, people will leave again. Um, and uh, if what you said would happen, uh, I don't think that they will really be choosing right? Uh, there's this famous saying that says, beggars can be choosers. So in a des desperate situation like that, they will go where they are told to go, right? Um, the question is, um, under what conditions they will have to exist there and um, how long they will have to stay, right? Because there are certain regulations that um, do not really allow for refugees, let's say, to go back to Ukraine temporarily with, without losing their uh, temporary protection status. So it, it, the bureaucracy is there, the bureaucracy is present. It's not as easy to become a refugee as uh, just crossing the border and settling wherever you are. Um, and it takes weeks and weeks of, uh, you know, uh, uh, signing up for things, receiving documents, and so on and so forth. But we are in a very desperate situation. And Ukraine is a very big country. Uh, I don't have to tell this audience, but you know, people around the world tend to forget that when they look at the map, you know, they see huge Russia and small Ukraine compared to Russia. Ukraine is an enormous country. And uh, um, the refugees that we have right now in Europe that's definitely not the maximum that can be. And, um, you know, uh, the, it doesn't really relate to your question, but I think regarding Ukrainians, the best united policy for the European Union would, to, would be to make sure that Ukraine wins this war as fast as possible, so that, you know, millions more of Ukrainians don't come, and then the millions who are in European Union, they can actually go back home. and. This would be, um, I would say, the best investment into resolving this specific refugee crisis, which, which can get a lot worse. This is our wish from all of us, but it exceeds the topic of our conversation. Gerard Knaus was a little bit restless when I used the word relocation which is not an elegant word at all. So, 
It goes to you, Gerard, and then Janina Ochojska. European Union and EU countries, can they introduce any other mechanism rather than coercive mechanism so that the natural wave in case of Ukrainian was heading for Poland and neighboring and close by countries. But in the case of refugees from North Africa and Near East, naturally stopped in Italy, Spain, Germany and France and UK before Brexit. In all these cases, we are facing a natural tendency and natural eagerness of millions of people to settle down in the place of their choice. So do we, as the European Union, have the right? Do we want to? If so, how to decide for those people, partially at least? We cannot hear you, sir. Does it work now? Tak, teraz tak. Okay, very good. Well, let me be very, very clear. My colleagues and myself have been arguing against administrative relocation for the last six years for one very simple reason. It simply does not work. We've seen it with the Dublin system, which is a form of relocation, where in the last 10 years, the country that has had the most asylum applications per capita has been Sweden, which is the furthest away from the Mediterranean and where uh, Dublin just always failed. You couldn't move people against their will in any significant numbers in the last 10 years to any country. So administrative quotas simply do not work. Even if you want them, they just, you can't administer them. You cannot send a mother with a child from Poland to Spain and say, stay there and she will stay there. That doesn't work. But what we've heard before was very important. The European Union took a common decision that Ukrainians should be welcomed. But then what we now need is information that is the information Ukrainians get about which countries are serious about making this promise a reality. So we should, and my recommendation would be to Ukrainian civil society, and please also contact me and my colleagues because we are traveling around Europe uh, in the capitals, talking to ministries, talking to parliaments, to say exactly those experiences. Why are there only 100,000 people in France and 50,000 people in small Ireland? You know, they are not a Ukrainian, big, no big Ukrainian diaspora in Ireland, and there are 50,000 and there are 100,000 in France. If one can then have a European uh, strategy that talks about improving conditions. Because in Spain, the conditions are also not easy for people to get social support, to get housing. And in Italy, social support for Ukrainian refugees is incredibly difficult to get. Now, you can say this doesn't matter. Let's leave it like it is. But if another two or three million people come and they all stay in Poland or the Czech Republic or Slovakia or Germany and Austria, the reality is that you will not have people in apartments or children in schools, but if another two or three million come, you will have them like now in Germany, they are beginning to again use the sports grounds in schools, you know, tent cities. And that is unfair towards the Ukrainians. So what I'm recommending is civil society, you know, can mobilize. No French government needs to approve that Ukrainians come to France. If a French city, if a French region says we have places, but we need to make sure that the administration, the social support, the, uh, the uh, legal problems and, and procedures, you know, to register children in school, that this is transparent and that European countries learn from the best and are not in a competition where some countries try to make it as difficult as possible to then hope that people don't come. So I think this is a major challenge also for civil society 
for researchers in Ukraine and in Europe to use this chance to try to raise standards everywhere. Because to conclude, administrative relocation, telling people they must go somewhere, that doesn't work. But trying to raise the standards in different countries so that the promise of giving protection is meaningful and not just empty will become incredibly important if, and it has been said before, President Putin uses and uh, fulfills his threats and uses weapons of mass destruction, whether nuclear or chemical weapons, which he has used in Syria. And when he succeeds in destroying more infrastructure, then people will have to come to Europe. We will need to have uh, a, a adequate accommodation. And for this, we need to prepare today because clearly Warsaw, which already has, you know, what the mayor of Warsaw's right hand told me a few weeks ago, 140,000 people just in the city of Warsaw at the moment. You know, you might have another 50,000, but not another half a million. And so then we need Europe-wide solidarity for decent, humane conditions. The question to Janina Ochojska, Brussels. Leaving aside the administrative burden, the atmosphere in Brussels, attitudes in Brussels, Brussels activities, what Mr. Gerard Knauss was speaking about, support like financing, transfer of good practices, regions should kind of self-trigger themselves and open their arms open the organizations so that they can accommodate refugees from Ukraine and also the ones who are still waiting. In Turkey, for example, this is what we are going to discuss, who want to come here. This non-administrative line of thinking, but this line of thinking that is designed to support when it comes to knowledge and finances. Do Can you see this kind of thinking in Brussels? Much to my worry, there is no strategy that would foresee what we are going to do in Europe during the upcoming winter because many refugees from Ukraine will come here owing to the fact that it will be difficult to survive during winter in Ukraine. Uh, I'm putting the war aspect aside, whether the situation will be better or worse. We will have a greater wave of uh, refugees because of winter. And I cannot see any strategies, national strategies, governmental strategies, pan-European strategies relating to how to prepare ourselves. Are we ready? We are not, I believe to accept one million, three million refugees from Ukraine. It's alarming for me because, as it was the case of February, it was people's spontaneous, people were spontaneous. So uh, there are some kind of organizational um, insufficiencies, people were taken care of. But now the winter is coming. We are facing energy crisis and this requires thorough consideration and preparation where people can live because the shelter is the most important. Food, clothes, they will not take it away will be short of places to live in. Potential, potentials exist. It has been there for, for, for good. So when Russia attacked Ukraine, we might have prepared some facilities. We might have started this kind of work. Now, 
it's too late to do anything. And it's hard for me to say how Europe will be coping with this, how we are going to cope, we in the sense of Poles, because we'll have the biggest wave here in Poland. I'm calling out, start now, if you have not started yet. There are self-governments that are getting ready. But remember, Polish self-governments, local governments, have very limited capabilities owing to the state's policy that tries to staunch the uh, self-reliance of local governments. Poland is one of the few countries that has not filed in the application to European Union to be financially assisted when it comes to the care of Ukrainian refugees in Poland. Money is available in different funds. Poland, because Mr. Kaczynski said, we are not going to beg. I'm not going to be a beggar, Kaczynski said. Poland has not received the money and will not receive unless they submit an application. This is what I don't understand because this is quite a lot of money. I hope that different countries will exercise their solidarity because what we're speaking about relocation. When a wave of Ukrainians were entering Poland, there were orders from different countries or information 50 places in the Netherlands, 40 in Spain, and families and people from Ukraine, if they made a decision, they were transported. But it was an informed consent. And every country has to prepare their social assistance to support Ukrainians. But this is a different story. Question to Natalia. Among your friends, the people you know and people you get in touch with, are the fears strong that the hub that we are having now, as you said, is mainly based on civic involvement of people simple involvement of people to a lesser extent, involvement of the state, will run out of this energy. People's energy will dry off. Um, yes, there are such fears, among many others. Uh, and these are the fears that we Ukrainians back in Ukraine also share. Um, because we, we know that um, the load is heavy of uh, having to accommodate and support millions of Ukrainian refugees. We also remember about the energy crisis. We're going to feel it too. And uh, uh, my co-panelist is, is absolutely correct in saying that a lot of Ukrainians um, won't be able to survive the winter in Ukraine uh, the way it is now because According to our estimates, uh, over 800,000 homes were either destroyed or, or damaged. And, you know, if when the weather is warm, um, th there are other ways in which you can survive. But without uh, electricity, heating, um, not just hot water, but even cold water, uh, there isn't much you can actually do. So uh, there is fear that um, people will get tired of having to deal with our problems, um, that um, they will get uh, frustrated with the energy crisis that will also be painful for you know, populations all over Europe. Um, and uh, um, we do see fears outside of the country uh, in increasing due to the nuclear threat as well. Right, so there's more talk about Ukraine um, needing to concede some territory to avoid this doomsday scenario. 
Um, but I'm going to say that there is another fear as well. And in Poland, it won't realize as much, but in other countries it will. And it is the fear of dealing with um, so-called Russian refugees. Because if from Ukraine we're talking about the majority of refugees being women and children, in Russia's case we're talking about young men. Um, so that's also one of the fears that Ukrainian refugees are dealing with. Um, because they are afraid of hostility, they are afraid of uh, possible confrontation. And there have already been cases of those um, in Europe. Um, so, you know, uh, just one extra issue uh, to deal with. At this very moment, the war in Ukraine put away the challenge related to refugees from Northern Africa and Middle East. Today, when I was getting ready for the panel, I looked at the official website of European Council that said, surprised me, I would say, or even shocked me. It reads, from the culmination of the migration crisis in 2015, the EU has been implementing measures to control borders and influx of migrants. Therefore, the number of People staying in the EU without regulated status has dropped by 80%. That is on the official website of the Council of Europe. Uh, dog uh, proud uh, that we paid the Erdogan's regime to keep a couple of million people uh, at, at their, in the country and not let them go on, even by force, which means we are not focusing on people feeling good in Europe. We are focusing on preventing them from entering Europe. Janina Ochojska first, then Gerard. The situation we are in, we have been in since the 24th of February, that is the influx of Ukrainian refugees may change something for good in the perception of refugees and therefore open the door broader for refugees from Northern Africa and Far East? I'm, I'm afraid not. I'm not an optimist in this very case. That is because Europe is building the European stronghold. It closes itself to the uh, migrants and refugees problems. It will one day... Uh, let me interrupt you. Does it mean that we, as the continent, we are still racist? Well, you may name it like that. Different people will explain it by various means, fears, crises, by insufficient amount of work for people. Well, we know it's quite to the contrary. We need migrants. And in this ever-changing reality in Poland, we see it very, very clearly. We will not be able to discuss the whole European policy towards migrant and migration as such. We cannot analyze every single detail. Well, I need to say that from my experience, multi-year experience, I should say, only openness to migrants, free flow, economic freedom will allow to migrants to, to earn their living, enhance economic development. And the restrictions imposed on a human, those that enslave and humiliate them, uh, uh, bring bad results. I need to fully highlight, if Europeans are uh, unwilling to accept uh, Ukrainian refugees, if there is sort of 
resistance to continue solidarity and openness, we will lose the war, not the Ukrainians. We will lose our war for Europe. Because the Ukrainian war is in fact the war for Europe. And bearing that in mind, let us try to make our involvement as high as possible. And ladies and gentlemen, we have things to abandon here in Europe. I don't say we should quit everything, but we can always squeeze a bit on the bench and make some room. Gerard, the crisis yeah, and well, challenges. Of, here we go, over to you. Well, let me give you two numbers to put things in a, in a perspective. The total number of people who've been crossing the Mediterranean this year irregularly from Spain to Italy, to Malta, to Greece, to Cyprus. Until now, which is middle of October, has been around 110,000 people. This is less than the number of people crossing from Ukraine to Poland every single day in early March this year. Every day in the first half of March, more people crossed than have crossed the whole Mediterranean this year from Spain to Greece. So if we are talking about a migration challenge at the moment in our countries, it is 95% a Ukrainian challenge. And I agree completely with the previous speaker that the policy of Russia is to try to create pressure so that European solidarity with Ukraine is reduced. That parties that are pro-Russian are then going to say, let's make a compromise, let's not supply weapons. In reality, however, here is an argument that I think is obvious to everyone. If Ukraine does not win the war and does not take back its territory, we will not have 4 million people with temporary protection in the European Union. We will have 10 or 15 million because Ukrainians cannot live under Russian occupation or in a country where the war never ends. And then the man will come as well. So the only way to deal both with this war for Europe as has been said rightly, and the refugee crisis is in fact to support Ukraine. And let me give you just two more concrete examples for this. One, it's also financial. I find it shameful as a European that the budget support to the Ukrainian government, which is supposed to fund 8 million IDPs plus the war, plus the reconstruction of infrastructure, which Russia is destroying every day, that the budget support at the moment is largely, overwhelmingly from the United States, that the money from the European Union is far less. Now, at the moment in May, the European Union promised 9 billion. Of this, 6 billion have, been, have now been located, not yet transferred, but located. But there is huge worry in Brussels. And I know from commissioners that I've talked to in the last weeks, what happens beyond the 9 million? And Ukraine needs 5 billion each month from the outside, not to go into hyperinflation. Now imagine hyperinflation. I've lived in Ukraine for one year when there was hyperinflation in 1993, 1994. The whole, you know, this impoverishes the country completely. It's a disaster. And it would mean millions more refugees. So we need to have a serious debate in Europe not only how to prepare to welcome Ukrainian refugees in the winter, who want to go back as soon as they can, but also how to financially support people who are now in Ukraine, who do not want to leave and who depend on the Ukrainian government. So one debate my colleagues and myself have been pushing, and we will push a lot in the next weeks, is why are European countries not proposing to confiscate the 300 billion Russian foreign currency reserves in Western banks that have been frozen 
and take this money to already now support Ukraine and the reconstruction of all the infrastructure in Ukraine that Russia is currently destroying. Now, one last point on Turkey. I disagree with you. It is right for Europe to give money to Turkey. Turkey has opened its borders in the way Europe is now opening its borders to Ukrainians. And that is why there are millions, the biggest number of refugees in the world, Syrians, are now in Turkey. But let's not forget, 1.8 million Syrian refugees in Turkey, half of them, are children below the age of 18. Many of them have now lived in Turkey for years. And for the European Union to fund social support, education, health care for Syrians in Turkey, most of whom would like to stay in Turkey, is a good thing. The trouble is, at the moment, we are not doing this. European funding for Turkey has declined sharply because European leaders discovered that instead of cooperating with Turkey, which is what was agreed in 2016 in March, the last two years, Europe is not cooperating with Turkey. Greece, supported by the rest of the EU, is pushing people back to Turkey without any cooperation. There is no agreement with Turkey at the moment. There are pushbacks, there is violence, there is brutality, and there is less and less money for this huge number of refugees in Turkey. So if you're asking me what we should do, there is no alternative for Europe if we want the three three and a half million syrians in turkey to have a decent life to keep also supporting turkey financially which we are not doing at the moment sufficiently but for the eu this next few months the top priority is to ensure that the russian strategy of breaking european unity through creating a refugee number that we have not seen this is the biggest humanitarian crisis and challenge for europe since the 1940s. It's unique and we must meet it successfully. I think that the first part of your speech was a cold shower to what Natalia said, good and positive about admitting Ukrainian refugees, so we have counterbalances here. Both stories are true. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to finish this debate and our conversation. I believe that the key here is that we, as citizens, are involved fully to help Ukrainian refugees and Ukrainians from wherever the world they come from who have it far worse than we do. Do not sub subsee to bad emotions. Do not stick to stereotypes. We have with us Natalia Mielnik, Janina Ochojska, Gerard Knaus. My name is Piotr Kozanecki. I'm head of Onet News. Thank you for your presence. It's not always easy to recognize. It may look like this. Or like this. It may be a burden. But it is a responsibility that we embrace nonetheless. But if it means this for one person and this for someone else, maybe it ultimately means being there for one another. It isn't handed to us, but we know where to find it and how it feels, how it tastes, and what it sounds like when we finally have it. It means different things to different people, but for many it means everything. And if we all fight for it, will eventually bring us together.
Atlas Network is, as the name suggests, a network and it's global. We work all around the world. We're based in the U.S. We have about 159 partners in uh, the United States right now. And the bulk of our partners are outside, nearly 500 in total. Atlas Network, it connects people uh, from all over the world, defending the idea of uh, human dignity, uh, defending human rights and personal liberties. Atlas Network is focusing on, I think, the most important and moral cause in the entire world. We partner with local innovators, local leaders who understand conditions on the ground in communities facing real challenges. We look at the people from the worldwide freedom movement that are passionate, are ready to make a difference, understand local conditions, and we invest in them. At Atlas Network, we unleash individual ingenuity to enrich humanity. The United States does not have a lock on the idea of freedom and liberty. Those ideas are beyond borders. One of the main goals of Atlas Network is to eradicate poverty around the world. And we do that by investing millions of dollars in our partners' work every year. Historically, uh, wealthy nations around the world have tried to help low-income countries develop. The way we've been doing it traditionally has not really been working. So there's a movement to do development differently, and that means we need to step back as outsiders and rethink the role that we're playing in helping people in low-income countries achieve their dreams. We want to make the world a better place. We want to make the world a freer world. All of us want to leave a legacy and be part of something big to make a better world. This is exactly the work of Atlas Network. With our growing number of hundreds of successful partners, we're stronger than ever. Changing the world. Changing the world. Changing the world. Starts together with, with us. us.